people at Options House. Jumping Joe Young. How you doing this morning? Pretty good, Joel. How are you today? It's like some mornings I come in, Joe's all chipper, and we can we talk about things. And then on Monday morning, it's like I just have to like pry words out of his mouth. Uh, did you have a big weekend, or you know, you just recovered? Actually, yeah, we, I did have a pretty big weekend. I'll tell you what. Yesterday, uh, our visiting editor and I, Bruce Kennedy, went downtown to the Kelly Blue Book uh, data presentation at the Athenium Hotel and got uh, all the information on their data and analytics on auto sales and stuff and their forecast for 2014 and then data from 2013. So that was pretty neat. And uh, what else? I don't know. We've just been showing Bruce around on the town mostly. Yeah, it, I was that was going to be my subject, my surprise subject for you. We got the uh, North American Auto Show here in Detroit this we week. We sure do. Um, Bruce and Shubs are down there right now. Oh, really? Really? And Brent's going to update us on the historical trading patterns of Ford and GM during the auto show. Right, Brent? Here I come with your data. <laughs> uh, or wait a second. I'm not ready. Okay. Then what do you think? It, let's just start out real quick before we move on to the S&Ps and stuff. We do have the uh, the auto show going on here and uh, the big stocks in Detroit. A lot of people are big holders of them and they've been on a nice run here. But uh, I don't know. What do you think? Ford finally got over 16 here. Dennis, you want to you wanna pipe in on this? You it's get... popping here this morning too. Uh, maybe it's just the auto show that's popping it up here. But we're up another 11 cents here this morning on Ford. It's trading up at 16.19 right now. Went out at 16. I guess that's 12 cents. My math isn't very well here. Uh, but, yeah, we broke up over 16. We're kind of into that gap area, Joel. I know you like those gaps. We gapped down back on the 17th from the 1699 area, or actually the 1666 area, all the way down to 16. So there's a lot of air in here. A lot, very uncharacteristic for uh, for Ford to have a gap down. I, I believe that's when they were talking about some guidance or whatnot. Um, and now you have it coming back into that gap area. So we'll just have to keep an eye on that. There's really, really not much to look at until you get up to that low of the gap area, which was 1666. Boy, a lot of sixes in there. And uh, looking at the pre-market trading, uh, we've made a high at uh, 1621. So this, albeit with the S&Ps down this morning, Dennis, are my, something wrong with my quotes? Are the S&Ps actually trading down four points? They are down here again. We've had trouble getting momentum here this year in 2014. Seems like every time we get a nice little rally, we pull back here again. And your number, 1833, I think we're like, I feel like we've been talking about this 1833 number the entire year here. I know you were saying it was a triple top and then a quadruple top, and then we broke out, and then it made a low there, and now it's back here again. Are we ever going to get away? It's like a magnet, this 1833 number. Or not only that, but uh, basically for the entire trading year, the 2014, I know it's a little bit young here but our range for the entire year so far has been between 18 17 and a quarter which we hit uh last monday and then the high for the year has been 18 42 50 so so far this entire year we've had a 24 25 point range dennis so is it time to uh mortgage the house on a strangle here and the uh, on the s and p's of the spiders i mean we're gonna move out of here dennis well, and we do have catalysts coming up here, too. We're coming into earnings season. I know they say Alcoa kicks off earnings season. Really, what kicks off earnings season, I think Brent was saying that last week, is Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan. And they will report here tomorrow morning. So we do have some catalysts coming up. And obviously, the financials are looking strong. Maybe they can lead us out of this. I'm not sure. We're, we're going to find out that fundamental news there tomorrow morning. Right. Uh, I mean, you have, uh, you know, basically, you know, 10 days of uh, consolidation here. So I'm not going to do the strangle because the market just goes up. So I'm just going to buy like the 1850 calls in the S&Ps because the earnings are going to be good. Everyone's going <laughs> to raise a... guidance. They're going to they're going to triple their buyback, quadruple their dividend and everything's going to be rosy. Well, I mean, we're looking at individual companies here. You've had a few last week lowering guidance here. Now you got Lululemon coming out here this morning, and they are lowering guidance here too. So um, it's not rosy everywhere, and holy cow, LU, LU. Wasn't Sazi on here? Wasn't he uh, saying Lulu? He didn't know if they were going to be reporting that great here um, because he's right again if he was saying that. I can't remember if he was bearish on Lulu or not, but if he was, props to him once again. It's down 15% here this morning. LU, LU, trading down eight and a half bucks. 
Uh, actually, what it was is I, I asked him about it because uh, I think someone in the chat room had asked about it previously. And really what it was doing on the daily here and how often you see charts do this and it's like, okay, come on in. The water's fine here. You know, 5780, yeah. 57.90 is going to be the low here. We're going to break yeah. above 60 and then we're going to go to 64, then we're going to go to 70, right? I mean, it just, so you have all these people accumulating the stock, you know, probably a lot of shortcoming in that area. And then how much did they lower guidance? I mean, come on, how much, what are they? 71 to 73 cents for next quarter. Oh. Estimates are up at 79, but Wall Street does not like these Momo stocks when they lower guidance. And uh, what was the big, uh, why, why did it gap down? Because you know my goldfish memory, Brent. Can you go hunt down why it gapped down back there on the 11th when we went back from, from 68 bucks? all the way down to 60 sure can before okay, well, let brent before brent down. before brent chimes in i wasn't it uh haven't they had problems with a uh, succession of the ceo hasn't there been i thought it was something along those lines but we'll have brent hunt that up uh from a trading perspective though 4940 is the pre-market low we hit that in the eight o'clock hour getting a nice two buck bounce up here to 51 so those are your your early parameters, 49 and 51. Uh, look, I'm sure we're going to have to go to the weekly to get something going here on the downside. I don't even have to go longer than that. The weekly, I got a 52.20 back in the week of August 2012, <laughs> the first week. So you even got to go back to the monthlies, I think, here, Joel, to find real support. Uh, I do see some support. I see, said the blind man. No, that's uh, that's a little far away. 46.88 uh, back in January of uh of 2012 <laughs> i don't know that's a little bit uh a little bit overdone though but uh we'll just keep an eye on the pre-market low 49.50 uh you gotta imagine like a round number of 50 there's probably some bids sitting in the book here people look to cover some shorts uh but i do you did have that 46.88 low but then you also had a low i don't know 50 but pre-market low is what i'd be looking at 49.40 so that mid-December move lower was Q3 earnings. It actually wasn't the earnings. It was the guidance that was given mm. with the earnings. The earnings were strong, and the guidance was both the Q4 and the fiscal year guidance below the street when Lululemon gave that mid-December. So here is the guidance again, and they're lowering it. It's this guidance for the next quarter, though, and so they're obviously beating the stock here up because they didn't improve in the last month here, I guess. You often see this technically in the charts, too, and like you were saying, kind of sucker people in, where you'll see a big down move, stock loses 10 bucks, and then it consolidates for an entire month. And and then, obviously, you know that consolidation is kind of the battle between the bulls and the bears. you got the bottom pickers sitting down there thinking the stock's going to go higher, like you were saying, Joel. And then all of a sudden, fundamental news comes out, and all of these people are underwater. So now this whole area, this $57, becomes major resistance long term obviously we're not even going to come close there to that today but for whatever reason there's going to be major resistance up there because they got a month worth of people that have been accumulating the stock picking the bottoms who are seriously underwater in this issue here now but this is not looking good on the charts this looks broken 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 it, it doesn't just kind of remind you of remember uh, this was a little bit a while ago but isrg like they like they came out and uh when it was swooning down they came out and like they lowered guidance and then they whacked the stock. I can't remember. It was part yeah. of this big major bar down under five. They came out, lowered guidance, and then they lowered the guidance of the lower guidance, and then they came out. They, and they beat it up again. Yeah, then they came out, and they reported lower of the lowered lower guidance. And uh, it took a while for that to consolidate. I see this thing's back over 420. but Friday, I, just on Friday, it actually popped back up. It's interesting that you mentioned that. There was a headline breaking um, intuitive surgical. I'll just read from the Benzinger Pro. Intuitive surgical shares rally um, to over $400. As SunTrust Hazan sees next generation system, including drastically improved instrument set smaller lighter patient sidecar. So I don't know what that means, but it all means it was good for the stock because it went up 35 odd points there on Friday. So it was a big pop back up over 400 for ISRG. What's it doing this morning? Uh, it's given a little bit back uh, down 344 at 416.71. Uh, 424.58 was the high on Friday, so we'll keep an eye on that as a as a good level. A lot of people stuck short this thing, so the pullbacks here are not going to be as fun as they were before. Uh, 415 uh, has been your low in the pre-market. 
415 I'd keep an eye on that as an early support level and uh, it's funny we since we're talking about crazy $400 stocks well <laughs> it, it used there. to be a $400 stock and I was just I was discussing this with Lisa over the weekend and she I you know I said you know you know what this stock did they found out you know uh, a cure for uh, you know for liver disease you're not gonna have a liver transplants anymore and she looked at me like I was crazy well, I am, I am crazy, but she said one trial, you know, that they stopped early. She goes, is, you know, don't you think people would want to wait for a little bit more data until they go crazy on this? And then lo and behold, uh, they come out with some bad news this morning, huh, Brent? ICPT we're talking about here, and uh, I believe it was actually uh, the headline was maybe from uh, late Friday. I think this okay. broke actually after hours. Uh, but Wall Street Journal's headline there was that patients on the intercept drug had more bad cholesterol. So it wasn't all peaches and cream there like the market has been pricing in. Obviously, the stock going from $76 on that trial all the way up to nearly 500 got up to 497 on Friday. It's pulling back 116 points this morning. <laughs> it's crazy. This thing is moves up or down 100 or 200 dollars every single day. It's down to 329 right now. Um, it's so hard to trade this technically because it's just trading off the of headlines. But what do the technicals say, Joel? <laughs> we just made a low a little bit ago at 302.84. So we're getting a, a nice bounce up here up uh, to the 330 level. So I'll use uh, 302.84 and 330 as early parameters uh, in trading. If you look at the dailies here, that's not going to do you any good at all here because there's so much vacuum on the downside. I guess, Dennis, what's the only lesson you, you can learn from this? I mean, when you when you have a stock, let's say, you know, you're a Joe investor, you had a thousand shares of your portfolio of something like this. I mean, you got to sell it on the way up, you know, and, yeah. I, and it's hard to say, you know, if you had a thousand shares, maybe that that big of a position and you decided you wanted out, you know, maybe putting a hundred shares, you know, every 50 points or every 25 points or something like that. I mean. I don't know, Dennis. I know you've had a lot of winners in your portfolio, but you've never had something move like this, have you? I've never had something move up, I don't think, uh, 400% in two days. So, yeah, you need to ring the register on something like that. I mean, it's just an incredible move here. Still, even if you're up, you know, $76, it's still up at 327 three days later. Probably not that happy that you didn't sell up at 497 but you're never going to get the full move here either. And, yeah, I think you've got to, you know, when you have a two-day move, where it goes up 200 points and then another 200 points. It seems absolutely ridiculous. The market cap of the company went from one and a half billion to like seven and a half billion overnight here, not on a takeover, not on just on a drug trial. So it seems ridiculously overdone. I mean, I think, you know, these, there is times you definitely have to ring the register, and this was probably one of those did times. They, did, did they get options listed on this thing yet? I haven't checked yet. I don't think so. Like, I don't. I, there wasn't on Friday, so I don't know if they have or this not. Thing, if you just took a flyer, like, I mean, it, it, maybe there is. Let me go see. I mean, it's just something like this too. Like, let's say you don't want to sell the issue, and you and you get this kind of move. If there are trading options in it, I mean, you could have had like a 400 put or something. You know, thinking, oh well, I'm 40, you know, a weekly 400 put. Well, I'm only 50, you know, 50 points out of the money. And then lo and behold, we go 50 points out of the money, and then uh, you know, now you're you're 75. I can't imagine. Uh, the uh, the market makers wanting to t I mean to trying to price these options with the volatility. Yeah. Is there, Dennis, is there options on it? Yeah, there? there is options here. And actually, I do remember Chris was telling me, my buddy Chris Banny, who we've had on the show a couple times, he was saying he was actually trying to play options. And he's like, there is, and just funny you just said that, he's like, there's no market in any of these options here. So the market makers probably have really backed off the quotes here because, man, imagine being, you know, making a market and then, boom, this thing all of a sudden opens up 200 points on you. So obviously, uh, <laughs> that's probably... Uh, the major issue here, but they are trading here. There is options out on this thing now. SF Bright here is popping up and saying actually too um, that the options, uh, the new ones for the higher prices, did come out on Friday. So there is options on it, but they're probably going to be really widespread. So those what was he? What makers. was he trying to buy? What was he trying to buy? Uh... It's probably, Chris usually plays. He plays a different call spreads and does some different things. I actually don't know. I didn't ask him, but okay. he was saying it's so wide net. The the market was so wide that there was just no market in them. So they are out, though, so there's just nobody making an active market and it, like, close enough where you can actually probably put on, you know, a reasonable 
uh, at a reasonable price. So, so that's it, the one thing. Yeah, 373 was uh, was Friday's low. Uh, 30, 40 points away from there. So I'd use that. I mean, if you're really, you know, itching to get out on strength here, I'd maybe put something out at 370 and see what happens. I mean, if just that three points ahead of the gap. Because you could go 370, 375, 380. 385 and then you know you go get a drink of water and it could be back at 350 but uh wow what an what an incredible move yeah it's just nuts g-a-l-t is one that is moving in sympathy we talked about it on friday it had a big pop up on friday got up to 1788 remember i was complaining because i was trying to put a call spread on it from 15 to 17 and a half for 30 cents and i could have made the whole two dollars and 50 cents on friday one day later and i didn't get the call spread on uh, I was just, I ran out of time. It was in the last few seconds of the day on Thursday that I was trying to put that on. It popped up. It has pulled back, obviously, now significantly here with the ICPT. It's just chasing it. So the stock went from 9 bucks to 17 88. Yep. It's back down at 1371 here today. So similar drug they've got in the works here. So it's the price is just chasing around with that ICPT. Uh 1253 was low you just hit uh just in the 730, 745 really? hour. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But now you've uh since that you've made a, a rebound high at 1427. If you want to look that in the context, I mean here you only got another fifty cents uh to get up to uh Friday's low, which was fourteen seventy eight. I imagine there'll be a few offers at that level up to the nice round number of 15. A lot of these little companies, these um, drug stocks and biotechs, a lot of these biotechs have been really hot here too. But keep an eye on this ICPT because some of these other biotech companies, these little ones, have been really moving higher. And it wouldn't be surprising with the pullback and one of your leaders there and on, on this other drug, on the liver drug, that um, possibly some of these other biotech companies or these other little pharmaceutical companies could have some weakness here today. We do have some other guidance here. Wendy's, W-E-N, a stock we have not talked about in a long time on the show, is uh, trading up 69 cents here right now. They are guiding next quarter higher. They're seeing 10 to 11 cents. Estimates were down at 6 cents. Wow. Uh, we're up 7.5% on Wendy's this morning. That's a lot of Frosties. <laughs> I like those Frosties, though. Uh, let's see what we did here. Uh, we made a couple spikes in the pre-market uh, up to 940. 940, there's an offer out there at 940, folks. I don't, Dennis, uh, would you be willing to take, let's see, we're at 940 now. Would you be willing to take 940? 940, what do you mean we're at 9? We're at 910. 940 high. Oh, 940 high, okay. Would you be willing to take, this is just to, to get one of those lunches back, I think that we trade at 880 before we trade at 940. No, I, it's too close. 880 is too close. Well, it's I think 30 I like cents the either way. It's not like I'm trying to hoodwink you or anything. No, nah, because stocks pull back here. We just watched the thing pull back 30 cents. It could pull back another 30 cents here too. I do like this on pullbacks here. I was kicking myself. I was telling you before, Joel, I bought this stock a couple years ago at like five bucks. So I was like, eh, it's looking cheap. I was kind of a little bit of speculative play. It drifted down. It was back in, I think, early 2012, where I paid $5 for it. And then throughout 2012, it drifted down lower, lower, got down to like 410. So I was down at that point in time. This was in my investment portfolio. This wasn't a trade. It popped back up, got over five. And I think it got in the mid fives, consolidated for a while. And he's like, I'm like, you know what? I don't really like this company anymore. I sold it. And literally like a couple months later, the thing goes up to eight bucks. So <laughs> I'm always, uh, my timing was bad on that investment. I'm a pretty good trader. I'm still not that great of an investor, <laughs> but I uh, sold that one too soon. So I kind of hate the company for that reason. So I don't know if I'm going to take you up on a bet on this one. I do like it from the long side as opposed to the short side, but I think I got to get a pullback now. I want to see this thing in the mid eights before I'm going to get interested. And obviously if I ever got back to 850, there's great support down there, but I don't think it's going to see that increase in the guidance here today. It's probably going to find a little bit of support at 9, you'd think. Uh, 9.51 was your high that you had on November 6th. Uh, we've hit 9.40 in the pre-market. So even if you do get past that nine that 9.40 pre-market high, I think you can see tons of resistance here at, uh, at 9, 9.50. I mean, you also have to, I mean, it did have a big range uh, three days ago. You had quite a big range in the issue. What did, what did you have on Wednesday? On uh, Wednesday, you had almost a 50 cent range, but normally, uh, well, look at Friday. You had a you had a seven cent range. So here's something that moves. Let's say the average range is between 15 and 20. Call it 20, 25 cents here. And now you have it moving up 71 cents in the pre-market. It's been another 
you know, 25 cents higher. If you're looking at this from a, you know, standard deviation, you know, move, uh, you know, this is way overdone. Yeah, the average daily range obviously is a lot lower than here right now, but you do have fundamental news moving it here. But I don't know. What was the high, 940? 940 high in the pre-market, and yeah. then you had a 9. I don't think you're seeing that today. Yeah, but... I don't think you're seeing I think you're going to find some good support at 9. Maybe it can drift back up there, but that's uh, I'm, I'm not interested in this until it's in the mid-8s. So I think I want to buy it on a pullback. If it, if I'm, I'm not going to chase Wendy's. Also got a... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> also got Soda, S-O-D-A, and they are reporting preliminary results, and they are not good. Forty-one and a half million, and the sales was lower too than expected. Uh, Brent, do you got that full report there on the S-O-D-A in front of you? While he's pulling it up here, I'll just take a look at the pre-market trading here. Down eight bucks. Yeah, down eight bucks. Boy, hit forty-one ten. But don't call it a bounce here. The stock is really fizzing out on investors here. <laughs> 40, 41.10 uh, only bounced up to a 41.65 through that. So there's a lot, a lot of pressure on this thing. Uh, taking out some uh, support that you had. Uh, I mean, you got to go out a long time to find a good support level in this. I don't want to say 35 bucks, but uh, I will look under the $40 level here, going back to um, on our monthly charts, going back to uh, December of 2012, uh, a little bit of a year ago, you hit a 38.50 low. So if you're looking just to be a low ball better, get your bids out there, 38.50. So we have SodaStream reporting preliminary 2013 sales, 562 million. The street is up over 564 million. Company adjust, uh, excuse me, guiding adjusted net income in the range, or right around 52 and a half million. And then I think sort of the key comment that I seen with that report is they said that they are quote disappointed in the Q4 performance. Disappointed is never a good word to hear from the no, company, <laughs> and they are punishing it this morning here, down 17 percent. So Soda Stream, have you ever seen one of those Soda Stream machines, guys, Joel? Uh, I know I, I know Jeff, who's been on our show uh, a few times, actually likes it, so I hope he hasn't uh, let his uh, enthusiasm for the actual machine uh, parlay into a spot. But no, I mean, I've never – I mean, you basically make your own soda at home, right? I mean, it's Yeah, like, uh, it's my like buddy's a... got it, and I went over there, and we were making uh, root beer or whatever, and he's like a, got a sweet tooth. He's all a big fan of, you know, sugar, lots of sugar. So he put more sugar than even, you know, <laughs> more syrup than you would even – even be required to make and i taste this thing and my teeth started hurting just because <laughs> it's so sweet so i mean you can kind of make it as sweet as you want or if you don't want it quite as sweet you can do that too it's kind of neat it's neat to watch the whole thing happen i guess it's supposed to be cheaper too but i don't know it just seems like a lot of work to to make a pop i'd rather just go crack a pop myself if i'm gonna have one so um i'm i'm lazy though but i think the majority of people out there are more are lazy as well so i'm not a big fan i think not the, a big fan. i think I think these devices are like really big in Europe. I've heard that where, they love where them people over there. are more uh, not as lazy. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean it is good soda. I hear like it, the I hear the soda in Europe's like it's all flat. Is what I heard. Uh, I mean, it, what is well, it? Maybe that's why like the soda stream they yeah. can put more carbonation in it. Yeah. Well, no, I think they like I don't know ship and pack it over here and then send, or, or like the stuff that's like old label. Oh, I'll just send that over to Europe or something. But. Uh, Maybe people are opting out of SodaStream uh, to drink Jim Beam. Uh, they are this morning. Jimmy Beam, B-E-A-M, trading up here now. 84.43 went out at 66.97. It's up $18. Suntory Holdings Incorporated is supposed to acquire this company for 83.50 cash. It's trading 84.40, so it's funny how these mergers for cash, they end up doing, remember back in the day, we trapped like 82 and a half on a risk. Now it's, they trade above the cash takeout price. So I'm not sure, Brent, you know why it's trading up 90 cents over? It's just, you know, this market's just crazy like that. Uh, I'm not seeing any headlines there. I mean, it's, this is a the huge deal. The number is 83 though. and a half, right? 83 and a half per share. That puts it over, almost over 16 billion. So, I mean, a huge deal. Um, I'm not seeing any comments as of right now why it would be bidding up. Maybe. Is it is it a private company that's taking them over? Or yeah, private. Suntory. Suntory. I don't think Suntory's not traded. Nope. Private. Uh-uh. 
Well, I can't I can't disagree with their with their choice here. Uh Jim I'd like a little Jim Beam. Are you a Jimmy Beam fan? Yeah, well, uh for uh uh for my uh what do you call it? Mint juleps, uh for my Kentucky Derby parties, uh we put a little bit of that Jim Beam in there. So uh it's, livens up the whole party. Yeah, yeah, yeah it does a little bit. But uh <laughs> is there any um where else could we look? Is there gonna be any um any correlations? Sympathy plays? Yeah, any sympathy plays and uh in this, I mean, you really don't want to go to bear stocks. I mean, uh, well, you got Brown Foreman BF dot B. Obviously, um, that could be one sympathy play. Constellation Brands STZ. But I was looking at this one. This is interesting. Constellation Brands. Uh, I, I brought it up right when I saw that. It's actually just offered at eighty bid seven eighty eight eighty oh five here. But it had already been popping up STZ last week. So I'm not sure what the headline. So maybe uh, STZ. I think, was it was er- I think it was earnings last week, wasn't it? Or something I'm going like to that. look at the headlines here from the pro, too. Yeah, they're, they were raising out their outlook there for STZ. So it's already kind of had a 10-point move already ahead of this news. So maybe it's not going to pop as much. And BF.B is another one that could have a sympathy move. The BF.B is a little more interesting because it has consolidated forever here between 74 and 76. So Brown Foreman... I mean, there could be some sympathy plays. Didn't here. you used to? You and Ernie used to play the BF dot A against the BF yeah. B or whatever. And then... yeah, I used to do a lot of the share class arbitrage there, where you trade the one stock versus the other one. The BF dot A was the ill liquid one. That thing hardly ever traded volume. I think it trades even less now. Um, the computers, obviously, high frequency traders have pressed us out of that space because they've automated it to to death there. So, um, you know, obviously, it's just not as, as yeah. there's no inefficiencies there anymore in the short run. There's just, it's just always priced correctly for the most part. If I, if but back I, in the day, we used to do it. If I remember correctly, I think Ernie was playing this one pretty heavily, and they issued like a dividend out of one of the stocks. And then not the other one. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Oh, some, that's terrible if that happens. It was. Man. Some, it was something really funky. I'll have to. Maybe we can get him on the horn. But you know, he was just playing the spread. You know, a couple hundred up. You know, keeping a position on, scalping yeah. it out of it. And then one day they paid a dividend. And I know they paid the. We expected to pay the dividend out of the stock that he was long because I remember it took him. Uh, it took him. Uh, yeah, that. I'll have to. I'll have to ask him about that. Ernie would get angry too. Remember, he'd get pretty angry when he uh, something didn't work out. <laughs> well, that well, that was something that was uh, pretty rare to happen here. But look at uh, look at ICPT bouncing up again, Dennis. Uh, back What's at that? 350 here, we got a major rally going on. Oh. So we'll see if it gets to that 373, which was Friday's low before the end of the close or before the end of the show. We've got Goldman Sachs coming out, and they are raising their price target on Twitter here. TWTR trading up two bucks in the pre-market. Goldman Sachs raising the price target from 46 up to $65. And Twitter, don't call it a double bottom, but I'm going to try to call that 55.59 and 55.87 from the last couple of days a potential double bottom. Here's a question I have for Anna. Well, first of all, let's look, look at the pre-market trading here for uh, for Twitter, uh, battling its way back here in the pre-market. Uh, let's see what our high is. We're trading right up near the high right now. Ah, uh, no, we got up to uh, 59.50. So that's a high in the pre-market, getting a couple buck bounce. Keep an eye on that. Uh, looking at yesterday's range, we've. Uh, you know, got quite a bit above yesterday's high. Next, I call 61 the next level here because you had a high at 6081 on Thursday, 6126 on, uh, yeah, Wednesday and Thursday's highs were right there, 61 level. Of course, Dennis, you've identified the double bottom, but now they slap a $65 price tag on it, and it's already traded at 65 So does yeah. that mean that it's hit its price target and it's going down now? Or if you can buy it now... You they can say ex- another eight dollars. That's what they're saying. I think. Brent, do you have the Goldman Sachs note? But it already traded there. They're... It already traded up to seventy-four. Well, you should have sold it then. But now they're saying they're coming in and saying now it looks better here again. Now they're buying it and basically. But it are, so they're buying it now bucks. and sixty-five is their target. I don't know what they're doing. They're saying their price target sixty-five <laughs> bucks. So I don't know their individual well, strategy. Could've... They got all those walls, those Goldman Sachs people in there. You never know what they're doing. But. Well, I could say that I'm raising my price target from thirty to thirty-one, or from thirty to seventy-four, seventy-three, which is the all-time high. I mean, but you're I... raising your price target after the fact. 
Okay, and so they're not the after the fact. So they're buying it now, the and they're expecting it to go to 65. Okay. They're expecting it to, to get back up to 65 after. They're not saying it's already been at 65. They're saying it could get back to 65, which obviously the stock could get to 65. It's already <laughs> been there. But uh, So I agree with you on that point. It's still six bucks away, but that is a good point you're making because it is only $6 higher. It's not like they raise the price target up to $85 here. So it's not that far away. So this isn't like a typical come out, Goldman Sachs raising the price target, everybody coming by. They really didn't raise the price target that much. They're more, more just playing catch up here because their forty-six dollar price target was just out to lunch. So what they're so, saying is buy it at uh, buy it at fifty-eight, risk down to fifty-five, right? Three points, and you get or you know buy it at fifty-nine. Risk down to 55 and then get out at 65. That's what they're saying. Well, that's saying. a potential trade setup that you're given right now. I don't think <laughs> that, but that's not, you know, it's an interesting. You definitely, if you're buying this thing long from a swing trade, I mean, you got to give it to the 55 and a half. So I don't like ever giving something four points. I'm just cheap like that. I'd rather try to re get it on the cheap if it pull back down in the next couple of days, maybe try to get a play on. If it doesn't pull back down, I just don't get it. So. Um, kind of an extended head and shoulders top on, on top of a head and shoulders top. You 60s know. big. Yeah. I agree with that. 60s yeah. well, big. That 60s. would be the whole right shoulder if you're doing this whole pattern trading thing, which I'm not a big fan of patterns. But we have struggled at 60 early in December. Obviously broke out, got ridiculous when I went parabolic, getting up over 74 bucks, pulled back, tested the 60, kind of hell, got up to 70, pulled all the way back, but double bottom in around 55 and a half. Now we're trying to struggle back our way up to 60. So it's a level. It's a big number. Another high flyer kind of coming back down to earth here. Uh, and really very quickly, I can't, I'm going to be anxious to talk to Fiery about this one. Uh, Netflix uh, recovered from the earnings debacle, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Comes down 315, 310, gets all the way back up within 10 points of that high, and in a couple of weeks back here, we're down at 332. Wow. Yeah, it was a battle, two-month battle to get back up there, and basically in 10 trading sessions, we gave it all back again here. So it gave you a second shot. If you were buying up there at 380, it gave you a chance to get your money back. Uh, not good, though, for the shareholders now because we're down at 332. We know a lot of these Momo stocks really have not been performing well. We were talking about the Netflix, um, even off the Twitter. You know, you can say Facebook and Twitter, and they haven't been moving together lately, but a lot of these stocks do seem to move together, and when Twitter was starting to show weakness, Netflix did as well and now we're down here at 331.89 on netflix and chart's not that great on this one either i do have an area that i do kind of like if you're looking for a swing trade uh, or you know to cover a short here uh going back after it had the negative earnings and made the low of the move uh, you came up you had a little bit of consolidation period and you had four out of six lows between t- 325 even and 325 and a half uh, so that's only uh, seven bucks away from here. So if you're looking for a little bit of a target here on the downside, now I'm not sure if I'd uh, try a lawn trade from there, but uh, I'm going to be looking at that area in the next couple of days to be good support in Netflix. Let's move on to some of these other uh, stocks. Uh, Apple here, looking at that one, which has actually had a rough little week here, quietly just slowly drifting down. We're up over 560 there seven tr- sessions ago, down at 533 here now. What do you think on the technicals on Apple? Well, first, let's talk fundamentals. And uh, I was writing an article for Joe. Joe, are you there? Sure am. And I was writing an article, I believe it was last weekend before the uh, Consumer Electronics Show. And uh, I put in there that Apple is aimed to disappoint again at the Consumer Electronics Show. Look at you, fundamental analyst, Joel. Well, well, you, <laughs> you put that in there, but I deleted it. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get through the editor. <laughs> He's like, what do you have to substantiate that they're going to disappoint at the Consumer Electronics Show? I'm like, nothing. But uh, <laughs> it's just a feeling. <laughs> it's just, a, yeah. yeah. What are you going to do? They're going to, uh, I mean, they have for the last couple of years, right? You know, this is part of my uh, Tim Cook getting fired thesis. You know, they're, they're, <laughs> you they're, they're, they're coming out with no, no innovation, no new products. The only thing they got on their side is uh, Uncle Carl, you know, begging for, you know, increased buybacks and increased dividends and that, whatnot. Uh, but, 
looking at it from a technical perspective here, you had that big run up from a little over like 512 up to 550, and that was just a vacuum within four or five trading days. And now you're coming back down to that area. 533 is currently where we're trading. It's holding up okay. It's relatively flat on the session. Uh, but we're looking at yesterday, Friday's low, 531.11. Uh, if, in fact, that doesn't hold with the round number of 530, uh, you could be looking at your low from November 26th at 524. Coming back on the upside here, uh, on, um, on Friday, uh, you had a high just above the 540 level, 540.80. Now you've closed a good seven points away from there. So that's think that big resistance now will be coming down to 540 even. Uh, I like your resistance number 540, and I think support's even lower than that down at 520 because we did vacuum up. And I, we always say whatever you move up quickly, you can move down quickly. And we moved from four trading sessions back in November, late November, we moved the, from that 520 area up to 560. So uh, I won't argue with you. I don't think there's that much below here, and I think you got some pretty decent resistance up there at 540. And the two uh, tops, two tops that you had there uh, b above 570, do you know exactly what days those were made on? No. When they announced uh, the deal with uh, the deal twice with China Mobile. Both oh, the, yeah, yeah, that's right. Both that's those exactly. occasions, the stock popped up over. The first time it popped up, I believe, the 575. It's on uh, rumors. So yeah, that... uh, the, but then the second time when the thing was actually announced, a little more savvy traders only let it get to, like, 571 and change here. So uh, tide has turned here for Apple on the downside. What do you think of the Google? Because I know you were getting a little bit bearish there, and but I held that 1100, and then it started running up here again. But now we've had three days of consolidation here in Google as well. The, the pretty decent range there actually on Friday had a 17 point range, low of 1122, high of 1139. What do you think on this Google? Uh, 1122 and a quarter Friday's low, and then earlier in the week on Tuesday you had a low at 1121 here. So call that whole 1121.50 level. You take that out. I think you can be sneaking back down to 1100. Uh, don't have the exact date on earnings here, but it just seems like uh, what did Google's do for like one of their 50, 75 point down days, you know, from earnings. And uh, I mean, that's it's only just a feel from a technical standpoint. Uh, good to go north as long as it holds 1120. Um, after that, you have to key in again on that major support at the 1105 level. So 15 bucks in between there if you want to do a little bit of a uh, put spread or something like that. But uh, be interesting to see at, at before earnings, you know, how much they juice up the premium in some of these puts. Because, you ha I mean, with the historical moves on earnings days, I mean, if you don't hedge yourself on the long side going into earnings somehow, some way, I mean, I guess last time a hedge wouldn't have done you any good either. But uh because it just went straight up. But it just seems like it's been hanging out here for too long. And uh, the other thing, too, is like it did have that sprint after earnings. Remember, it, you know, it cleared, it had the gap up day, and just kept on going. Cleared that $1,000 level, tacked on yeah. another 140, 150. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I just how long can this thing just keep going? We do have earnings coming up on that, too. Brent, do you have the actual date? Because it should be mid January sometime. I would think somewhere around like January 18th, 19th area, which is only a week away. So, um, do they? I don't think they report this week, though. Do no. They? Uh, I don't think so. I'm hunting right now, though. Okay, Hunter. we'll let Brent hunt down the actual Hunter. date of Google here. But um, it, it's definitely due to report here in about the next week or week and a half. Uh, let's, let's move on here to Starbucks. Starbucks Ooh. actually trading slightly down here in the pre-market. It's trading at 77.23. Our good friend Sazi yeah. downgrading the stock here today. I'm a, I don't know, did he go in those Starbucks and take some pictures here again? I don't know. <laughs> 90 to $75. He's lowering his price target, downgrading the stock here. I like this downgrade. on And Sazi, like we've been giving him props, he's been all over everything. He was all over the Sears Holdings. He was all over even the Macy's. He was all over Lululemon. He's been right so many <laughs> times here lately that the guy's just, you know, seems to be on the ball. It's only down 44 cents here in the pre-market. He doesn't have the pull that the big guns do, but, man, he seems to be right more than he's wrong. And I actually just was playing around. I just shorted a little bit of stock here in the pre-market, just playing around with it right now. I'd love it to rally a bit and start shorting off the 78 level, though. What, what kind of target did he, uh, did he slap on this? 
75 bucks, so basically oh, he's just lowering from where he's at. So it's not a real bearish stance, obviously. Uh, he's just coming out saying that he doesn't think it's going, obviously, to 90 now. He thinks it's kind of going where it's at, and it could fall a couple bucks from here. I, I don't think he got – I mean, every one of those Starbucks that I'm in there are pretty clean, so I doubt if he got any uh, – <laughs> You don't you, think you, he's dirty you, floors? Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, yeah I haven't seen that. You know, them like, uh, you know – dropping like a rag on the floor and then using it to clean your table or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I said, I don't think I've seen any of that, so I don't want you Starbucks lovers to. I mean, people will only pay four bucks for a cup of coffee for so long, and then they'll give up. But let's give the technical numbers. I've been saying that for a decade. Yeah, you've been saying this is thing was at five I'm bucks. Rock. Never listen to me on Starbucks. I've tried shorting this thing all the way up, and I keep getting burned on it. It's like my nemesis. So, Because I'm getting, you know, I'm jumping on Sazi's bandwagon there. This will probably be the one I'll probably, I'm probably be the cooler there with Sazi, and he'll be wrong on this one just because of me <laughs> if I start shorting the stock. Two ways to play this one, trading down uh, 44 cents here in the pre-market. You could either be patient, like Dennis, and wait for it to pop back at 78, where you had three highs in a row between 77.99 and 78.15, so you can wait to short into a little bit of strength. Or you could play it the way I like to play it and sure to going through weakness. And, Dennis, you have to admit the $76 level is huge. You had, uh, had a couple lows back there in early December. You had a low there. That's the low for the year at 76.01. So that's the level. Shorten on strength, 78. Shorten on weakest, wait for a break of 76. Yeah, I agree. That $76 is absolutely enormous. Hey, Late December, we bought weekly three too. Times. Look at that on the weekly, too. Yeah, 76 is huge on this. If it ever does take that out, that could be the level, and that may be the time. Maybe that is the better play to wait till it starts going through 76. But 78 is not a bad setup either there. You're kind of in the middle of it at 77.23, so you got to give it a little bit here. I mean, if you're a swing trader and you don't care about giving it a buck or two, maybe you just try it now. Uh, but, you know, if you're a short-term scalper, more like me, maybe, you know, 80 cents, you don't want to take 80 cents of heat, maybe wait for it to pop up or wait for it to break down through the 76. Lots of different setups here hey, for Starbucks. Hey, real quick, just to get back to you on Google, Dennis, looks like we are looking at January 30th. That is going to be like... one, two, three Thursdays from now. Okay, so it's a long ways away here yet. So you're going to have some pretty good technical trading still on Google ahead of those numbers. Red Hat upgraded at Morgan Stanley, RHT, trading up 2 bucks right now, 58.60 it is bid at, went out at 56.81, had the gap and go about a month ago, and now it looks like it's going to try to gap and go again. Uh, and who was the upgrade by? Uh, Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley here. Uh, Red Hat, major consolidation you had between 56 and 58 after that big gap up here. Uh, now you are breaking above the $58 level. Uh, you did have a high at 58.71 on December 20th. Uh, looking in the pre-market, you got a little bit higher in that, up to $59. So uh, I don't know, kind of a might be a little bit of a head fake here if it uh, if it can clear that pre-market high of 59 here. Got let's see, I have to go to the monthlies here to figure find some resistance in this thing. Uh, Sixty dollars, nice round number. Uh, that's what you had for a high uh, back in looks like July of uh, excuse me in September 2012. Uh, you hit 60, so nice round number to keep an eye on. This Morgan Stanley analyst made a couple other calls in that sector. They also upgraded Autodesk, which is ADSK. That one's at overweight. Also upgraded Fortinet. That one also at overweight. And then downgrading Symantec, which is Sandy Yankee Mike Charlie to underweight. So I got a little bit of movement there. Some of the analysts doing some upgrades and downgrades here. Uh, we are running a little bit late, but I do want to quickly just talk about Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan because as we said on the top of the show, they will report earnings here tomorrow morning. So let's give some quick technicals here on Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan. Uh, Pre-market trading, Wells Fargo is just trading about flat right now. It's at 100 shares to a trader, 46 bucks, but spreads 45.86 to 46.05. So it's just looking like it's going to open relatively flat here um, early in. Or in early trade uh financials have uh, led the market higher here so far or led yeah. the market to being flat this year so far if it wasn't for the financials uh we'd be in we'd be hurting but uh, going to the wells fargo made a new all-time high on friday 4620 
45.94 high uh, close. That's an all-time closing high. So let's just look for uh, you know 46.20. People will probably gang up um, on that area ahead of earnings. Uh, you know, just use that as a reference point. And uh, I just say you have to call J.P. Morgan like the Teflon stock because uh, you know they they you know they come out they admit wrongdoing with um, with Madoff. You know, the pay the fine. Oh, we got plenty of money to pay the fine here. I mean, to me, I don't know. I think they should be penalized a little bit more than that. But uh, the stock price, uh, you do have a double top up here at the 59. Let's see how high did it get. Double top, 59.43 to 47. So that's your major resistance. That's a buck a high. Uh, coming back on the downside. You know, just holding above 58 on several occasions. So it uh, till it breaks below 58, and when it does, it'll go straight to 57 because there's no support in the 57 handle. But uh, those would be the parameters. If you're short, you want to take this thing off ahead of earnings. Look at the $58 level. If you want to sell into some strength ahead of it, uh, wait for that 59.50 level. But you know, th this thing. Uh, one thing more than the Wells Fargo, the uh, the J.P. Morgan really really whips around on earnings day yeah and both yeah definitely jp morgan's beta is a little bit more than wells fargo a little more conservative stock wells fargo uh, we knew we learned that from the whale trade back with jp morgan but uh yeah 58 bucks a big number there but obviously these things are going to trade off fundamentals here now so it's more jockeying the day before earnings to get fundamental players coming in here so technicals start to take a back seat already here today as the fundamental players come in and are jockeying ahead of the earnings report and then obviously it's going to move off earnings tomorrow morning Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to have Gary Kalpam on. He's a registered investment advisor and host of Investor's Ed. So we're going to have him get his outlook on the market. Uh, we'll be right back. You send me. Welcome back, traders and investors. We have a very special guest on today, Gary Kalpbaum. He's a registered investment advisor and host of Investors Edge and president of Kalpbaum Capital Management. Gary, how are you doing today? Uh, I am having a great day. Thanks for asking. Great day. A great Monday, huh? What, what's kicked off your week so well? Did you come in a little bit short or what, what, what got you in such a good mood today? I woke up. <laughs> Well, that's always a good thing. I mean, it's always that's a good, a good day. <laughs> no, nah, just uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, every day is a pretty good day. That's the way I look at it. Good. Okay. Uh, briefly, just give us your education and market background. Well, I started in the '80s, and uh, I started at the Petty Stock Farm. Uh, knew nothing about the market, 
uh, was out of the business by 1988, 1989, and I decided if I was going to be in the business, I'd better figure out a theme, a thesis, and a discipline. And in 1991, a, a buddy of mine handed me these little green and blue books, uh, and it was the uh, printed O'Neill, uh, 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 William O'Neill Daily Graphs. And I started uh, reading his books and studying and going to his seminars. Uh, I then started looking at Stan Weinstein. I realized there was something to this, that there is a rhyme and reason to markets. There is precedence to markets. Uh, things repeat itself. Great stocks all look the same. Bad stocks all look the same. Bear markets and bull markets all show the same characteristics when they occur. And I decided to, uh, you know, go after it and, and study it like a madman. And, uh, you know, 20 some odd years later, I'm where I'm at. So are you looking more just at the charts then and making your decisions from the technicals then? Well, I am, number one, first and foremost, uh, a technician. I will not buy a stock in a downtrend. I will, uh, we, we could talk about shorting in a second, but I am looking for the strongest stocks in the market. We have a theory that it's easiest to isolate strength when the market's weak. It's easiest to isolate weakness when the market's strong. Of course, we never have any down days right now, so it's very tough to <laughs> isolate the strength. Um, and, and then it's just a matter of study. In my house... I have printed out, and I am not making this up, probably about 15,000 to 20,000 charts separated by uh, years, decades, and what they look like. And we have just basically come up with specific, unadulterated characteristics of bull and bear markets and what they look like. And then, of course, the other part of the equation is to trade them, which is the hard part. So are you focusing, you were saying you're focused on like weak stocks in the down markets or weak stocks in the up markets and strong stocks in the down well, markets? Well, what we're just saying is, is that, uh, you know, it's easy, easy to, easiest to isolate the other side okay. uh, at all times. Like right now, we know where the weakness is because most things are strong. Uh, but, you know, at any given point in time, we just want to own the strongest stocks in the strongest groups. I am a fundamentalist also, so we are always looking for the companies with the great earnings and revenue growth, knowing that the, the, best, that the stocks will top out on their best numbers ever, because once the numbers start decelerating, the stock usually already knows it and starts heading down, uh, akin to what Apple did over the last year while the market kept going up. The issue with Apple, very simple, is their... Uh, uh, business slowed down because of uh, no new products, and uh, so we're always looking for changes uh, when that stuff comes along. Okay, so here we are. The market's been very quiet this year. We identified the S&Ps have been trading in a 25-point range for the entire year here. Right. So the bulls can look at it as, hey, we're going into earnings season, just taking a breath here, consolidation to move higher. So, you know, you're probably getting the same signals from your charts. Are you, you know, is there some stocks here that you're looking at that are developing? I see, you know, you're identifying a long base here. Are there things that you're looking to go into on, on the long side here? Off, based off this consolidation okay. period? Well, let me say this about the market. It, it is the ultimate in strength when you're, you're up 30% in a year and you can't pull back a percent. Yeah. Uh, and, and people are worried that we haven't done anything in seven days. It is normal to pull back and rest after a move up. We had a strong December. I am seeing nothing in the way of real trouble right now overall in the market. And we'll know a lot more this week. And the simple reason why is we've seen a lot of good strength in the last uh, couple of weeks in the big financials, like yep. the Citigroup and the Bank of America and the J.P. Morgan. And very simply, markets never get in trouble when the big financials are acting well. So all their earnings do come out this week. We'll be watching the reactions, and maybe things change. Uh, we'll see. But on the other end of the spectrum, I measure markets by how many stocks are busting out of, uh, of, of range, and we're just getting too much of that. Even though the market hasn't done much in the last seven, eight days or whatever it is, the airlines have been breaking out, the, the biotechs have been in fuego. 
Yeah, uh, th- there's just enough meat out there. Uh, the truckers, I saw J.B. Hunt move out on uh, uh, Friday. Even the Bristol Myers in, in the drug group. Uh, so I-, I don't really see much trouble. Uh, th- there is no doubt the market is way overdue uh, for a big correction. But when you have the Fed printing a trillion bucks a year, uh, that's what's holding the markets up. You know, last year the market was up 30%. Earnings growth was about 3 to 4%. So there's going to be heck to pay down the road. Uh, I just don't think we're in, in, in that realm right now. And I suspect uh, any pullbacks, further pullbacks, will be controlled and rotational. Uh, and we'll just look for things as we go through earnings season. So do you go both long and short here? Because obviously you're looking at lots of stocks breaking out here. Yeah. And you were saying off the bat you do have some sectors that you've identified as weak too. What are those weak sectors that you've identified? Yeah. Well, we won't short in a, in, a, in a big bull market, even though there are some sectors that are not working. Uh, but over the last year, uh, gold and silver, though they've been uh, you know starting to perk up a little bit here, they've been in a bear market. And everybody's wondering why isn't gold going up when Fed's printing? Well, the bottom line is it's in a bear market. Bear markets are simple. The stair steps go down, and until the stair steps turn up, you, you better not argue with it. And I have a bunch of gold uh, bull friends that just do, do not ever give up while they've lost 30, 40 percent in the last year and a half. Uh, other areas that have been weak is housing, but housing starting to perk up a little bit. Uh, the bond market has been terrible. That one may be bottoming near term. The utilities, the real estate stocks, uh, pretty much terrible. Coal stocks. Uh, so there are areas that just stay away, but on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the gaming that broke out three months ago and refused to even pull back an inch. I mean, we're talking Winds Resorts and Las Vegas Sands. Uh, I mentioned the financials in the regional banks. You got the trader, uh, the Ameritrade, E-Trade, Schwabs uh, that are working well, and just overall. I, I, and, and as I mentioned, the biotech. So uh, and let me. Mention, throw it in there, the semiconductors. And when you have the semiconductors and the financial strong, uh, you better not bet against the market. They have a great, great, great record of uh, forecasting which way the market's going in the near term. Okay, so you said that you won't short stocks in a cyclical bull market, which we're definitely yeah. in here. Do, would you, uh, in order to like change your opinion, are you looking for something in the fundamentals to change, uh, you know, uh, an action by the Fed? Or do you have like a secret number that you keep a look at on the Dow Jones or the S and P's? Because I mean, you definitely incorporate technical analysis into your work as too. So, yeah. do you, do, you, well, do you have a level? Well, it's not really you... a secret number, but we have found from our studies, uh, and I defy anybody to argue this. You got you. I use the 50-day moving average slash the 10-week moving average as the uh, a point where a market will turn from bull to potentially bearish. Uh, when I mean potentially, you can break below it for a few weeks and then turn back above. That's kind of normal to have when you have a regular correction. Uh, but w- if we see a break of that level and an Ill- inability for markets to get back above it, if we see financials rolling over the same way, and then you got the leading stocks in the market, the leading growth names start to do the same then you have an idea that the market's getting in trouble. And that just is not happening here. Uh, the, as I said, the only issue the market has right now, which stretched and extended from its recent move, so it's due, and I suspect we can, can, pull, can pull back a little more. Uh, but until I start to see some serious distribution and the market really rolling over, and, and look, this is just taking a, photo, uh, a picture in a photo album, uh, until that occurs, it is just crazy to get too bearish. And uh, it's amazing to me uh, about people uh, I've been watching the last few days, and I go on TV a lot, people saying, what's wrong with the market? And I was even asked that on Fox last week, and I said, nothing. It's, it's just sitting for a week after rallying uh, for, for seven, eight days into the end of the year. So I think we're in good stead. It can change in a week uh, once earnings come out. But right, right now I'm feeling pretty good, and we'll see what happens. That just shows you how much we've been in a bull market. When we pull back 1%, everybody's like, what's wrong with the market? They're not used to any pullbacks here now. It, it is think- quite amazing, but I, but I will. I, I have to add something that I've been writing about, um, and, and it's my big ultimate worry is that – all the things that happen in the latter stages of a bull market 
are starting to occur. Right. Uh, number one, margin is just skyrocketing. Now, there's a good and bad side to margin uh, because it's bullish when margin expands. It tells you people are taking risk, but when the market does top, margin comes off very quickly, and that's a lot of selling. And margin is just expanding, uh, you know, you know, big time here. That's number one. Number two is I, I follow sentiment indicators. There are no bears out there, really. Um, you, the bearish ratio is down to 14. We haven't seen that number. That's 14 percent since uh, 1987. Uh, uh -oh. And I'm, we're not saying an 87 is going to happen again, <laughs> but I think that's noteworthy. And there's just a ton of bulls. On top of that, you're seeing. Tons of IPOs, tons of stock splits, a lot of frothiness. This Intercept Pharmaceuticals just went from 70 to 440 bucks uh, because of a, a drug in trials. Even though I'm noticing it's down 120 today, you don't see that type of action at bottoms. You usually, see them closer to, to important tops. So we're starting to see some of the sentiment uh, that comes along, uh, you know, in the months leading into a big correction, if not a, an outright bear. So we're giving our people notice uh, to pay attention in the next few months, more so than in the last three years. And things can happen very quickly here. So oh, how yeah. do you? So how do you? You know, what signal specifically should we, our listeners and should you know? Are you advising your clients to look for to be able to tell when this top is really in? What is the signal well, you're looking for? Well, there's nothing like the action in the market. And if you first off, there's a few things. Number one, if you start to see the markets open hot every day and finish down, that tells you in, in, into these uh, you know hot opens, uh, you know the big money is selling. That's number one. Number two is you'll start to see uh, a 150-point down day on heavy volume, and then it rally up 75 points over three days on no volume, and then another 150-point down day. Uh, you know, these are the identifying marks to tell you that the complexion has changed. There's nothing like seeing the selling to know that there is selling. You know, people have this idea about guesswork. You, you really don't have to. Uh, it, once you start to see two or three bad down days and inability to rally off those down days, uh, that's all the evidence I need because usually accompanied with that, as I said earlier, you'll see leading stocks, uh, growth names start to get ripped apart. You'll see the city groups and the Bank of Americas, which just broke out of trading ranges, fail the move and start rolling over. Uh, and all of a sudden, you'll hear good news being sold. Uh, we've had nothing but bad news being bought over the last three years. Um, and, uh, you know, that dynamic's got to change. I haven't seen that part yet, but we're getting ready. We, we think we're a few months away, but we won't act until we see a, a quote-unquote, the whites of the eyes of the, of the market. Okay, uh, just shifting, you know, we're talking quite a bit of te technicals here, shifting a little bit yeah. of fundamentals. Um, I noticed your comments um, on your blog on Friday, you know, regarding the unemployment number, you know, yeah. payrolls down big, rate up, revisions coming into play. I mean, you have a factor here of people dropping out of the workforce that's driving unemployment rate down. Uh, I mean, does, that, does the data that we got on Friday, does that just mean QE forever? Uh, we think so. Uh, you know, look, we believe that these people running the Fed think they're heroes. And in a sense, they kind of are because, you know, they went real easy back in 2009, and it helped the market out. But then they realized, man, we can control markets. And they, I think they think they can control markets forever. And I think they think they can just print forever. But history shows Ultimately, at the end of the road, printing money is not good news uh, because markets get distorted. And uh, we know about the bond market yield and price have been distorted. I can't even buy a bond. I'm finding things yielding 3% that should be yielding 8% uh, in, the, in the bond market. And eventually, things are going to go to the norm. And guess what? A lot of people are going to get burned. And, and we think the same things in the market. We, think, we do believe it, it's somewhat of a bubble here, regardless what other people think. Uh, you know, bubbles are made by uh, policy. 
and they did it in 99. They did it with the housing market in 05, and when everybody said, oh, housing's going up forever, and don't worry. And we're hearing that type of talk right now that, oh, the, the Fed keeps printing, the market's going to keep going higher. We disagree. We think there'll be a point in time where valuations do matter, where the big money decides to take a mallet on top of the market and start hitting it on top of the head, and then we'll head down. We just don't know when. And as far as the employment figures, we don't believe anything coming out of the government right now anyhow. We never said that years ago. We just don't trust them anymore. Uh, the inflation numbers are ridiculous. They took out all the important things when they measure inflation. Uh, GDP numbers, just so you know, they just changed the GDP numbers O uh, for the good, meaning that they're always going to be a little bit higher than they used to be. And as far as the employment number, we, we uh, wrote the Labor Department and asked them for a list of people that supposedly left the workforce, which makes the unemployment rate look better. And they say they don't make that list. We, we just do a survey of a certain amount of people. We come up with our numbers. So we'll, we'll take that for what it's worth. Now, okay, so obviously, do you think this all happens this year? Do you think this bubble, if this is a bubble, do you think it bursts this year? Or do you, you, you know, the timing here is obviously very tricky to call, but do you think yeah. we're getting close enough that it does happen in 2014? Or could this march, like bubbles we know can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And it's so hard to predict when they are going to burst. My, my, think? my, I, I, the first answer is I don't know. My guess is this year or next year, but my other part of the equation is I think we could have some kind of, uh, kind of climactic move first. Uh, you know, typically climactic moves come from rallying markets. And if you go into 99, you will see the NASDAQ continue to uh, broke out, continue to inch up and inch up and was really strong. And at the time, everybody said it was stretched and extended, has to pull back. And th boom, then you had the climactic run where you can make a ton of money in a matter of a, a couple of months. But of course, that led to the, uh, you know, the disaster. We think there's a chance of that happening and we're looking for it. And so far, you know, nothing we have seen, uh, you know, takes away from that stance is the market just refuses to correct. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. We'll know more. You know, we get thousands of companies reporting earnings in the next three weeks. We'll get a better idea uh, for where the strength is going to be. We're hoping some stocks gap up on big, on big numbers, kind of like what Facebook did a quarter ago and Cree did nine months ago uh, and Google did last quarter. We love those that type of action. Uh, gaps on earnings are usually the strongest sign of accumulation by the big boys. Uh, and that ensues any day now, so uh, should be a fun year. Okay, and just uh, from you know, just from what you're you're saying here and implying it, you don't have any hedges on right now. Basically, you're you're, you're no. you don't have any shorts on. You don't have any any hedges on. If if you did get that that kind of turn in the market, I mean, do you go to do you you know do you start selling calls? Do you start buying puts? Do you go 100 percent cash? Do you short the market? I mean, is there a progression that you go through? How you know how would you? Because that's the thing. I mean, you think there's a turn in the market. People are heavily invested, sitting on huge huge profits and I think the biggest problem you see with you know long term investing and I know you 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 put a lot of emphasis on market timing here. How how would you suggest people to transition their portfolio over if you did get that kind of signal? Well uh we were up a half percent uh during the last bear market. Uh and basically our signals, you know, they, they worked out perfectly. You had the financials top out first in early 07. You then had your semiconductors and retail top out in, sept uh, in uh, the summer. Then you had the major indices in October, and then you had uh, September, October, and then you had the big cap growth uh, names uh, first day of 08. Uh, so we'll see a progression. Uh, okay. You know, tops usually happen the same way. And basically what you do is stock by stock, sector by sector, as things start, uh, you know, breaking down, you just get the heck out of the way. Uh, and, and then let it progress to it wherever it decides to go. Because you, you really never know if something's going to really turn into a bear market until it starts moving along that road. Uh, it, it, it's too tough. Uh, uh, 08 was a little different because the financials were melting down, and that gave you a real good clue that something really nefarious was going on. Uh, that typically doesn't happen. You'll get hit in the financials, but they'll drop 15 20%, which leads to like a 30% bear market, which is kind of normal. But for me, just get the heck out in cash, uh, and then at a given point in time, when you get your first or second rally up, you start buying uh, ETF shorts. 
uh, like the SDS and, and things like that. Uh, you know, the problem with doing that in the last uh, bear market is you have, and you may ha- get it again. You just get so much government interference that the re- that the rallies are so sharp uh, they squeeze you. And if you remember the talk, just the rumor of it rallied at 400 points in like 15 minutes, the Dow, and then the market gapped up the next day 500 points. So literally in 15 minutes, uh, the Dow went up 900 on tarp. So you never know what's in their bag again from right. the government, yeah. and that's always the worry in bear markets. But your best move is short the rallies. Don't short after the market's already down, and you're going to get squeezed. Okay. But you still think there could be some type of capitulatory move where everything goes like parabolic here, um, like we did back in 99 or 2000. So you still think it's way too, maybe too early to be short. Uh, yes. Uh, and look, I do not think we're going to get six-fold moves in, in three months like we saw in, in 99. Uh, but I, 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 it just feels like, there, you know, as much as you think selling is going to come in, they just really haven't seen it. Uh, and I, I'm waiting to see if the market just busts out of here and just starts going, you know, straight up uh, for, for a matter of uh, a few weeks, which ends, uh, you know, the bull cycle. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet. I don't know. Let me be clear in saying I don't know if it's going to occur, but the market has the makings of it, and, and, and we'll watch and see. Uh, you know, our, the key thing we do is we watch and we interpret. We don't try to put our opinion into the market because we usually get run over when we start thinking too much. We believe the market gives all the great clues uh, to where to go and what to do. It does it in things breaking out of range, breaking down out of range, climactic moves, uh, sectors rolling over, breaking up. We've seen recently the emerging markets completely underperform, so we're out it. We don't want to own those. Uh, so we're always just trying to see where the leaders are, where the laggards, and always be ready for changes, uh, because if you're not, uh, you're going to be dead meat. Okay, uh, we've had Gary Kaltbaum, I'm registered investment advisor and the host of Investor's Edge, as well as president of Kaltbaum Capital. Gary, thanks a lot for your, really your concise and uh, informative view on the markets, and uh, well, we'll uh, we'll observe your uh, uh, your predictions here for uh, you know a potential melt up in the market, and we'd certainly like to have you on again. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, I appreciate you asking. All right, have a good day. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Okay, we're going to shift gears here to uh, mighty Joe Young with this morning's headlines. Hey, oh, thanks a lot, Joel. Say, Joel, do you go to the auto show? I've been there once. Just once? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm just, I don't know. I Wow, you, get, you got a free pass for me for, you know, cocktails or free food? I'll go. Anywhere that something's free, you're, <laughs> you'll show up, right? Yeah, I'll sign up for that. Okay. Well, I was just curious because I go every year. And uh, this year, the Car and Truck of the Year awards were given to the Corvette Stingray and the Chevrolet Silverado, respectively. Uh, The Detroit Auto Show, uh, both cars made by General Motors, naturally. And if you'll recall, the Cadillac ATS won Car of the Year for 2013. So this is another big win for General Motors. And nicely done, Mary Barra, with stepping up with a truck and taking the award. The awards that were announced today are another sign of a comeback for the automaker, says CNN. Uh, and this is, the, this is the first time GM has swept the award since 2007 when the Saturn Aura and Chevrolet Silverado won. The last sweep of both awards was in 2010 when the Ford Transit Connect and Ford Fusion Hybrid took these awards. Moving on, Volkswagen AG plans to spend more than or invest more than seven billion over the next five years in North America to revive its push to grab a bigger share of the U.S. car market. As part of the spending, Europe's largest car maker will introduce a mid-sized sport utility vehicle designed specifically for North America in 2016. The Wolfsburg, Germany-based company said in a statement today. Volkswagen will also start producing the Golf hatchback tomorrow at its factory in Puebla, Mexico, to supply U.S. customers. And in case you haven't heard yet, Suntory's deal for Jim Beam. Suntory, known for producing Japan's first whiskey, has agreed to acquire the maker of Jim Beam and Maker's Mark Bourbons, among other spirits, for $13.6 billion, according to Deal Book. Including the assumption of debt, the deal is valued at about $16 billion. 
Suntory is offering Jim Beam shareholders $83.50 a share in cash, 25% above the company's closing price on Friday. According to the deal announced today, Matthew J. Shattuck, Jim Beam's president and chief executive and current management team, will continue to lead the business out of its headquarters outside of Chicago. Um, in addition to Target, Neiman Marcus credit card info has apparently been stolen. It appears that Target wasn't the only retailer to suffer a credit card breach during the holiday shopping season. It's been reported that the upscale retailer Neiman Marcus has also had an unknown number of customer credit and debit cards exposed by hackers in mid-December, and the retailer is currently working in conjunction with the U.S. Secret Service to investigate the breach. It doesn't appear that any purchases made with credit cards on the online store was compromised, only cards used at retail outlets. Neiman Marcus says that they are currently attempting to notify those customers whose credit cards the retailer knows have been fraudulently used after a purchase made after a purchase made at a Neiman Marcus store. While the extent of the breach is still unknown, it would be wise to take some basic steps to both protect your credit and debit cards if you shopped at Neiman Marcus this holiday season. CNN has a report out today saying that a Southwest Airlines plane carrying more than 100 passengers landed at the wrong Missouri airport on Sunday. Southwest Flight uh, 4013 from Chicago's Midway Airport was scheduled to land at Branson Airport on Sunday evening, but instead showed up at Taney County Airport, said Brad Hawkins, a spokesman for the airline. The two airports are about seven miles apart and serve the same area of southwest Missouri. Hawkins said he did not have enough information to say why the plane landed at the wrong location. The landing of the plane, a Boeing 737 carrying 124 passengers and five crew members, was uneventful and everyone is safe. Hawkins said. Associated Press has a report out saying that Tyson Foods is recalling nearly 34,000 pounds of mechanically separated chicken products that may be contaminated with a strain of salmonella. The U.S. Department of Agriculture said on Friday in a news release the product was not sold in retail stores. It was produced on October 11th and shipped to Nationwide for institutional use. The chicken has been linked to illnesses in a Tennessee correctional facility where seven people were, got sick and two were hospitalized. Let's see, and on this day in history, the first public radio radio broadcast took place. A live performance of the opera Caballero Rusticana is sent out over the airwaves from the Metropolitan Opera House in New York on this day in 1910. Did you know that, Joel? No, I did not. All right, well, maybe you'll know... I got three more here. Maybe you'll recognize some okay. of these. Okay. On this day in 1942... This is auto show related. Henry Ford patented a plastic automobile, which was 30% lighter than a regular car. Ironically, today we're seeing more carbon fiber materials showing up in vehicles to reduce weight and aluminum, as in the F-150, which is 700 pounds lighter in its next iteration. On this day in 1968, Johnny Cash performs live at Folsom State Prison. Eh? You remember that one, Joel? I was five. Yep, close enough. And uh, this is a shout-out to Jake on this day in 2012. The passenger cruise ship Costa Concordia sinks off the coast of Italy. There were 31 confirmed deaths, with one still missing, Russell Rubello, among the 4,232 passengers and crew. Jake loves to hear about ships sinking, not so much about people dying, but cruise ships seem to be his thing. So that wraps it up for today's editorial headlines. And just a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, that the show would not be possible without our dear friends at Options House. They'll offer you 150 commission-free trades if you sign up for an account through this page. There's buttons at the top, at the bottom right. Go ahead and take a click on those buttons, sign up for an account through Options House, and get 150 commission-free trades just because you listen to Benzinga's pre-market info. And with that, I think Brent is here somewhere. Let me see if I can find him. Brent, are you in there? Who is it? Um... Housekeeping. Yes, I'm here. Okay, cool. What? But this sounds like Joe. Where's housekeeping? Oh, um, I brought you a towel if you want. Would you uh, like a fresh cup of coffee? Thanks, buddy. And uh, you can tip me with some of the morning market movers and rating changes if you want. Well, good because that's what I had lined up. Sweet. All right, got a ton of movers this morning. Actually, a really busy news day. Sort of still trying to catch up on everything that happened this morning and over the weekend. A couple of the top movers to the upside this morning. Shares of Beam up more than 25% at last check. 
company received an 83.50 per share cash offer from a, I believe it's a Japanese firm called Suntory Holdings. Shares of Beam are trading around, let's see, 83.88. Got about 20 to 30 cents premium built in there over that 83.50. Joel, what's going on with shares of Beam currently? Yeah, we do have a little premium here uh, over the uh, takeout price, so uh, maybe there's a few arbitrage factors uh, we're not aware of. Uh, taking a look at the uh, pre-market high, uh, someone got a little overdone. Maybe they misread that headline because you got to spike up to 87.13. Uh, now you're kind of settling back into that takeout price, uh, 83.50. So the company hasn't responded that they're looking for a better deal yet or whatnot or haven't seen anybody else uh, come in and uh, you know talk about the deal or any regulatory problems with it. So uh I guess anything over 8350 here is a little bit uh, a little bit of extra premium. Not seeing anything yet on the analyst side of things, but I'm sure there will be a flood of analyst notes coming out following this one. Actually, actually I do see a SunTrust Robinson hum Humphrey comment on Beam, but I haven't dove into that report yet. This is more than a 16 billion dollar deal. It's not exactly peanuts here. Pretty big deal. So Watch that spirit space this morning. You can also take a look at Brown Foreman, that is BFA or BFB. Also look at Constellation Brands, that is STZ, Sandy Tango Zulu. And then if you want to get a little European with it, Duagio. This is one of the larger spirit makers, DEO. However, that is in Europe, so not expecting to uh, not expecting that one to move quite as correlated as those other two that I mentioned. Also watching shares of Wendy's this morning. We did talk about this one a little bit early. Wendy's shares trading up between 6 and 7% in the pre-market session. We got about 12 minutes before the opening bell seeing Wendy's shares at 895. Wow, just holding under that $9 level. Company issued a bit of guidance. Also gave an update on same source sales. Let's see. Company says expecting Q4 adjusting EPS in the range of 10 to 11 cents. And the street is all the way down at six cents. Nice strong Q4 number there. Fiscal year 13 adjusted EPS expected in the range of 29 to 30 cents, and analysts are down at 25 cents. So getting a bit up in shares of Wendy's this morning. Company also did announce a 275 million dollar buyback plan. Cheers to all the Wendy's holders out there. Just breaking, just a few minutes. Just real hey, quick hey, on that uh, yeah. Wendy's. Of yeah. course, I couldn't. I couldn't get uh, Dennis uh, in on a bet here, you know, Mr. Momo here. But uh, we did hit a uh, ridiculous 940 in the wow. pre-market. didn't see that. Yeah. Holy we, cow. We, yeah, yeah. So it's, if you think it was up, it was up more. Uh, it did trade up to 940 um, on the dailies. Uh, you did have a high in the issue. Uh, you were going up to uh, 950 uh, back in, uh, I believe it was in November here. Yep. So I just think right. that whole nine. I mean, now that you're back under nine here, not by much, but I just think it's going to really get tough sledding up to that 940, nine, if we can even climb back in that area here, because it's a big move that like we were just discussing. You know how much the stock actually moves. Now you're getting a move in the pre-market on less than 100,000 shares here. So. Probably a lot of stock in the book here to sell too, so uh, you know might hold down that open a little bit. If you want to be super patient and wait for this thing to come back down to the 850 level, that's where it broke out from. That's where you had multiple highs uh, going back to last week. So you would have liked this one a little bit more if it could have held over nine bucks. As yeah, morning, correct? yeah. I mean, I'd be more apt to be a seller over nine than mm -hmm. a buyer uh, above nine here. All right, so did just have a bit of breaking news, I don't know, about 20 minutes ago or so. Juniper shares, got Juniper shares, Juliet November, Papa Romeo trading up about 7% at last check. Did have a Bloomberg report and the subsequent release from Juniper. Elliott Management issuing a, quote, value plan for Juniper Networks. A value plan, value plan does include potential buybacks, dividends, and other cost reduction efforts. Juniper, excuse me, Elliott now showing a 6.2% stake in shares of Juniper. According to the release that I just posted a few minutes ago, this value plan, as, as according to Elliott, says that the plan could result in $35 to $40 per share price. And if you notice, Juniper shares trading 
just over 25 bucks here. So Elliott with quite amount of value that they see in shares of Juniper. Joel, take a look at this one really quick. Are they a fund or are they uh, um, uh, a... Elliott, I believe they are a hedge fund. Okay, so they're... Uh... They're talking their own position here, and uh, it's doing a very good job for them. Uh, 25 20 is just a recent high that we've hit in the pre market. You can see once uh, we're just laboring at 23 and a half, 24, and then the news came out, shot up to 25.50. We're going to have to go a little bit longer term here. Uh, boy, you did run into trouble at the $25 level on a couple different occasions here. Uh, going back on the longer term charts to identify that level. Uh, we are trading above it now. This is the highest this issue has traded uh, since 2011. In October and November of 2011, you had a top at 25.35 and 25.60. So if you've been holding on to that stock for that long here, you're coming up to... Uh, very important level. Haven't quite hit that 2560 yet in the pre market. Let's see what happens there, uh, above there. And then you get into uh, a big vacuum area. I'm not sure what caused the stock to go down so much back in uh, July of 2011, but uh, keeping an eye on the 2560 level. And you know what? Juniper shares did move higher at the end of Friday's trading session. If you look at that Friday chart, the stock did spike. I don't know, a couple percent at the end of the day. Shares were trading around 22.82 with <laughs> just two hours left in Friday's trading session. So if you look from that move, if you look from that price before that pop higher at the end of Friday, the stock is actually up more than 10% this morning. Quite Funny how that works, bro. Hmm, strange. How, how, maybe, that maybe, maybe could you check the timestamp? Maybe that came <sighs> out on Friday. Hmm, mm -hmm. I don't think it did. Yeah, and... Uh, <laughs> Wonder if we could go check the blotters and see uh, who was buying that yeah, stock. Yeah, you know, that'd be interesting. Bit. Too bad Jared's not on to uh, subscribe to our conspiracy theory here. But you know, you, I, you're showing that pop here right now. And I was actually talking to a buddy of mine who uh, recently uh, got into the brokerage industry, and he's only been mm -hmm. doing it, I think, less than a year. And he said there's one thing that he knows for sure about these markets. What's and that? I said, what's that? He goes, that, that somebody knows something before he knows somebody it. Somebody knew something. Yeah. Somebody, I mean, you see the news, you see them, and there's a very, we were we were discussing a little stock that I own, and I said, where's the news? Where's the news? And we found it out, and we found, like, the move happened, and then the news came out. And I guess you have a have a, uh, have a a scenario here, too, in Juniper now. You think that's going to move any of the other uh, networking stocks? Or I mean, those those guys trade extremely close together. I would take a look at maybe something like Riverbed, maybe something like Autodesk, maybe a little F5. What about Cisco? Um, Yeah, I mean, that's the same space, but just being the size that Cisco is, it's definitely a little less volatile, obviously. Right. But, I mean, I do see shares of Cisco trading up, I don't know, a couple, like 20 cents currently. Um, they, well, they got some pot, they got a little love and Barron's. Ah, a little Barron's love little, would do it. Yeah, a little Barron's pop here. Uh, coming right back up, you had, uh, bad earnings, the gap down, you creeped your way all the way back up to the 2250 level. Uh, the recent high of the move has been 2247. You haven't quite, uh, you did get up to 2250 in the pre-market, so, uh, Potential breakout scenario uh, in in uh, shares of Cisco, and then uh, I'm not sure what news hit the wires, but uh, then talking about another breakout here, uh, Merck Merck and Company. Uh, we knew it was, had been flirting with that $50 level forever and a brother. There has to be some news coming out on this thing because we've uh, we've moved up a buck in this issue here over. Geez, over the last, like in the last 25 minutes. So uh, we'll see if we can find some news on that. The former high of the move had been 50-50. Uh, it had topped out at 50-42 on December 2nd. You got up there again at 50-40 on January 7th. So now that 50-40 to 50-50 level will now act as support. All right, so on Merck, there was an FDA re review of the company's Verat. Vorapaxar? Vorapaxar. Vorapaxar. Oh, yeah, I should have known that one. Uh, also, company announced that it has began rolling out submission of its BLA for MK3475. I'm assuming that those are the same products. 
Eight seven six five three zero nine. Is that what you said? Wait, that's like that <laughs> that like seventy song. <laughs> so actually, today, uh, sometimes you know you get Merck big 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 sack big name moving higher, and just sort of some overall sentiment. It looks like today there is a bit of news that Merck traders are sort of digesting this morning stock up over fifty bucks. Couple more, actually, just one more. I want to take a look at to the upside this morning company called Zeltec Aesthetics, Zulu, Lima, Tango, Quebec, nearing a billion dollar market cap company. They did have some preliminary Q4 sales figures that were strong in the range of 35 to 36 million and analysts on the street down around 30 million. So ZLTQ shares, we do have trading up more than 12% at last check. Close around 21.40 on Friday. Now trading right around 24 bucks. Seems like 24 is probably a pretty major level in shares of Zeltec. Uh, yeah, you get the news on the. Uh, was it a drug trial? You said. It, uh, uh, I don't see. I don't see them commenting on any trials. They just had some preliminary, some strong preliminary Q4 sales figures. Oh, okay. Uh, 24 is what you hit uh, in the pre-market here. A uh, nice move for the stock. We'll keep an eye on a $24 level. Uh, this thing has been creeping up since uh, April. This thing was a $3 and $31 stock. Now we're trading at $24. I bet you this is uh, all-time high for the thing. So if you're looking for something here in a, a breakout mode here, hasn't had a losing month here uh, until you go back uh, to July of this wow. year. So. 24 is your pre-market high. That's about the only number I can give you. Probably go to 25 after that. So we were watching shares of Intercept Pharma like hotcakes last week. I see PT the stock. Let me pull up my chart really quick. Stock rallied, what, about three, 350% or so last week. Very <laughs> strong end to last week. Had surged 280% on Thursday, added another 170% on Friday. Stock is down, holy cow, about 20% this morning. And I mean, this is, you're probably going to see a bit of profit taking anyways in this name, but it seems that the company did have some concerning news. Let's see, late, what is that, Saturday, late Saturday, yeah. there was a WSJ article that looked a bit concerning, and then late last night the company did come out with a release confirming what that WSJ article had warned of and we are trading now under $340 shares closed just under $446 on Friday what I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know what technical levels can really do for you in this one, Joe. Uh, you know, they could do something here. I mean, you have to look at it. I mean, I think it's it's kind of it makes it kind of easy I mean, it's really uh, difficult okay. when uh, stocks have these kind of moves, but I think it, it also, in another in another way, you can look at this 373 low uh, that you had on uh, on Friday, and you can definitely call that a a, uh, a resistance point. Uh, 360 uh, since we made the low here has been the high uh, since you made that low under 320 here. So I just say. You know, 373. You could use that as a target here. I would, and I and I know we're not going to get this information for a little time, but I would just wonder if there was any insider selling going on <laughs> last week. I mean, I'm not sure what the lockup is on shares or something right, like right. that, or what the restrictions are. But holy mackerel, if you've been working your whole life for a company or something like that, you got a lot of money invested. I mean, how could you? I mean, on, on, and, and what it was was the it they they halted a trial because the early results were good. Mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't. Yeah. I mean and come on, you know from all these years covering you know stocks and pharmaceuticals and biotech companies. I mean what's one trial? I mean that's you know it's like getting married after going on a first date with somebody. I you mean know? it's probably a pretty accurate analogy. <laughs> okay, all right. S and P's are open now. Markets open. Trading ding, ding, down. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, we're a little bit late. We were. Oops. We were on our conspiracy theory rants here. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, but uh, what we have going on here? First of all, we have um Apple sinking under 5:30. I mean, this stock is just not in a good mode here. Uh, disappointed last week at the Consumer Electronics Show. Really, nothing new in the pipeline. To, you know, besides Carl Icahn. You know, the only thing with this is when Carl comes out and twirl, twirl, I, I bought another eight, 87 million shares or something like that. And me and uh, 
Tim Cook are going out for tea or something like that. That's when it's going to uh, take the rally of this stock. Uh, but um, support uh, support an Apple if you're trying to play this from the short side here. Uh, we haven't traded under 530 in Apple in quite some time here. Uh, you did have a low in the issue at 524 even, and that was on November 26th. And uh, let's just move on here, take a look at a few other issues. Uh, Goldman Sachs uh, comes out with some good news on uh, Twitter here. Uh, ups the price target to $65. Uh, just a level to keep an eye on here in Twitter. I'd like if you're, you know, if you've been trying to pick a bottom on this and uh, you're playing the rally, uh, the highs from the end of last week in Twitter were. Uh, 60 let me get the exact numbers here for you you had a high at 6081 on Thursday and 6126 on Wednesday so call that whole $61 level um, your first stopping point here in the rally uh, coming back on the downside uh, made a quick low at 59.37 but uh, that doesn't quite fill the gap until you get down to uh, 58.76 uh, bad news on a uh, Lululemon. Today. Oh, that yeah. was actually the next one on my list. Oh yeah, what do you have? To just, just a ton of uh, guidance from this morning. For whatever reason, I'm getting so many companies issuing quarterly guidance. I guess it's about that time ahead of the earnings season. Uh, early this morning, Lululemon did issue some guidance, expecting Q4 sales in the range of 513 to 518 million. Analysts all the way up over 540 million, and it looks like the company had previously guided in the range of 535 to 540 million. So some reduced sales guidance there. Also, the EPS figure reduced from a prior 78 to 80 cents per share to a new range of 71 to 73, and the street is up at 79 cents. Bad guidance for Lulu. Okay, opened 51.56 at a 51.75 high. Uh, now we are bearing down on the uh, $51 level. I'd just like to alert our traders uh, that who are in this issue here. Uh, trading well above the pre-market low. When the initial news came out, they took it down to 59.40 here. Looks like that level may be safe here since uh, they haven't been able to take it under 51 uh, in the session so far. Uh, not really touching this on the long side here. You break above the open and uh, the, that quick high at 51.75. Uh, may, may cover short above that area because uh, you can got a ways to run to get in the yesterday's range. But here's one. Looks like they got a little overdone here in the pre-market. Also another Momo name moving to the downside today. Shares of SodaStream down over 20%. Another guidance story here. SodaStream says expecting... Fiscal year 13 sales around 562 million, analysts around 564 million, and then company says expecting adjusted net income around 52 and a half million. Sort of a key takeaway from that release was the company said it is quote disappointed in Q4 performance, and this is what happens when these Momo names come out with a bit of concerning news: shares plunging below the $40 level. All right, here's one where you had a, a 41 holding up in the pre-market, a 41.10 uh, low holding up. Uh, then you opened uh, during the regular session right at that that, that uh, supposed support level, 41.45, hit 41.62. Now you come crashing down. Boy, there's a lot of momentum here on the downside. 38.83 low, so if you... Uh, Ignored that that gap and just went out there and shorted that thing. You got a good trade going uh, Going to the monthlies here. We are coming up on an important level 38.50 was the low back in December of 2012 50 cents away from that uh, So that could be some targets for some shorts or some people looking to nibble on this thing on the long side and when I see action like this in Lulu and in SodaStream here, I sort of immediately jump to the Green Mountains and uh, the, uh, what's another good one here, the Deckers of the world. Not trading in the same space, but the fact that these are some of the most momentous names in the stock 
right now, or at least over the last couple of years, they sort of tend to kind of move together. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be exactly the case here. I'm looking at Green Mountain right now. It did gap lower and sort of bounce down to a morning low, but is bouncing into positive territory here. Yeah, we have. Oh, it is holding up here, though. It looks like uh, uh, kind of been doing what the the market's been doing, and that that's had a nice rally, and then trying to you know continue. But what it's doing. It's, it's uh, consolidating here on the daily chart, uh, holding above support at the $80 level. Had a low on a Friday at 80.10. We've hit 79.99 in today's session. So that $80 level, huge for the long term in Green Mountain Coffee. And uh, coming back on the upside here, uh, recent high of the move, which might be an old, I don't think it's an all-time high, but you had a high on January 9th at 18 or 8123 we've hit 8122 in the session so a potential resistance point for green mountain coffee and since we're throwing all those other stocks into the to the heap and just carl's been awful quiet he right? has yeah, really what's you're going, right what's what's going on i mean i don't know he's kicking his heels up maybe a little bit sitting at his desk got his hands behind his back just enjoying some of that profit, I guess. Yeah, maybe uh, selling a little Netflix or something. But uh, here you go with uh, Herbalife here, uh, finding some resistance here. You made that 83.51 high, and I can't believe what I can't remember what the news was associated with that. But you did get over get over 83.350, and now sellers have targeted the 82.50 level, um, including today's session. You've had three highs between 82.32 and 82.49. Uh, so uh, keep an eye on that whole 82.50 level, major resistance. Uh, coming back on the downside, uh, your low from Thursday uh, was um, 80.11. So still two bucks away from there, holding on, uh, holding on to that $80 level. Uh, good support for Herbalife. How about, I know you talked about this one a little bit earlier, Intuitive Surgical. If we're just talking about some of these uh, Momo guys, we had Intuitive Shares up, rallied strong to close last week's session. Intuitive Shares up more than 10% over the last three or four sessions of last week. And there was a report late Friday. It was uh, some bullish comments from a SunTrust Robinson Humphrey analyst. The stock closed. About 8.5% higher on Friday. Shares are down about 35 this morning, but it's probably related to just a bit of profit-taking following that strength at the end of last week's session. You probably had some people uh, looking at their uh, their newspaper, checking their stock quotes on Monday that uh, been holding on to this thing. It just stayed under 400. You had for a couple, two months to buy it under 400, and then it creeps up and breaks out. Uh, 424.54. 424.58 was your high on Friday. Uh, opened, rallied a little bit, and now coming back down to the $400 level. Kind of hard to find support in this thing. I mean, psychological, $400 is a good level. Uh, you did have a high at 389.85. Uh, that's going back to uh, last Thursday. That's another support level, but uh, just kind of inching its way down after a big day on Friday. One sector that i sort of been watching under the radar here has been the casino and gaming sector. Seems like analysts have been getting a little more bullish over the last, I don't know, couple weeks here on the casino and gaming stocks. Um, and you do get a lot of data coming towards the end of the year on just how casino and gaming results were in Macau. That is basically China's Las Vegas. We got a, a user out there, Gilson, asking a question on MPEL. This is Mike Papa Echo Lima. This is basically one of the one of the only NYSC or NASDAQ listed Macau components. Uh, huh. Las Vegas Sands, Win, and MGM. They all have Macau components. However, they are separately listed, not under LVS or Win or MGM. So, to me, MPEL is kind of. Uh, kind of an, uh, a Western play on Macau. Hey, you learn something every day here. There you go. Uh, 4355 high in today's session. Uh, we did get up to 4368 on Thursday. So uh, keep an eye on that entire area, 55 to 68, uh, as resistance the way the market's holding up right now. Uh, not only is this a 52-week high, Scott, that looks to be like an all-time high for the issue. So... Uh, 
Uh, above uh, 43.68, uh, then continues to break out. Uh, let's uh, let's just take a look and probably see similar charts here in uh, Las Vegas Sands. That stock is uh, breaking out nicely too here. A uh, little bit coming, a little bit off the high that you had uh, a few days ago. You hit 81.85. We kind of settled back down here. Uh, current high today 8110. You had Friday's high at 8073. So we could make out this $81 uh, level. Nice round number ahead of the all time high here. Uh, people identifying as resistance. Uh, if you slip under this 8024 low, uh, you have a little bit of a drop here 50 cent drop uh, down to the low on Friday at 7974. Joe, I want you to take a look at shares of Groupon. That is Golf Romeo Papa November. Looking at this level, we are we j actually just crossed under 1140, seeing a bit of consolidation right around this level between let's say 1140 and 1135. Going back to Thursday, the sec was kind of range bound for a good portion of Thursday's session, and right now we are back at that level. What did we talk about well, well last week? I did a few articles on it, and we kept on talking about it. I, I believe Living Social came in with a big chunk of stock to sell. And yep. What did what level did we keep harping on when we were talking about um, that thing? Remember? Hmm. Want to say was it like eleven seventy? No, we were we were talking about twelve. Twelve bucks, okay. Yeah, twelve on the yeah, button. Yeah, you had a well, you had uh, just look at all those times that you've traded. You had one, two, three, four, four times, four days in a row back in the beginning of the year where you got over twelve. Okay, and then but you were only able to post one close above that area at uh, and that was one only. So that was a big level. I know this is above the uh, the Goldman Sachs target of what they, they had on the issue because I remember they went, oops, they kind of gave it a little bit of a downgrade here, which turned out to be the low. Uh, but now you have it coming back. Actually, as we are speaking right now, Groupon is on some ma major support. Uh, the last three trading sessions, 11.32, 11.32, and 11.34, and then when it snuck down on December 31st here, 11.4, uh, Excuse me, on the 31st, he hit 1138. So, uh, Groupon uh, looking to rally off this 1132 level. Uh, if not, uh, the next major support point would be 1114, and that was your low on December 30th. We did have a little bit of news coming out from Groupon this morning. They announced a merger deal with a company, I am going to attempt to pronounce this ideally. They're going to buy this, uh, looks like an, a, fa a fashion retailer for $43 million in cash. So Groupon traders out there do have a little bit of something to sort of go off of today. Okay. All right. Uh, final minute of the broadcast here. Um, S&Ps have managed to pop up here. Uh, we've made a high at uh, uh, 36 and a quarter during the regular session, 38.75 overnight. So we keep an eye on that whole whole area. We've been in a training range since the beginning of the year, kind of getting uh, near the top of that range at 18, uh, 1838 to 1840. Uh, so I'm sure the market will be sitting tight uh, ahead of some of the big, big earnings reports we have coming out tomorrow. So. Hope everyone has a good training day, and we'll be back with you tomorrow.